Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. This is Kurt Repencheck, your host at National Parks Traveler. This past week, we saw the changing of White House administrations in Washington, D.C., and already we're seeing some changes in philosophy over how public lands should be managed. One of the first things President Biden did was call for a review of boundary changes to national monuments that President Trump made during his tenure, specifically the boundary changes to Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante National Monuments in Utah. There likely will be many other changes to managing public lands in the months and years to come, and we'll work to keep you on top of them. Last week, we also brought you a fascinating story from Sunset Crater National Monument in Arizona, a story of how an unusual eruption of a cinder cone volcano more than 900 years ago altered the landscape and forced the native culture living there to flee. You can find those and other stories about national parks and protected areas at nationalparkstraveler.org. One of the changes President Trump made possible before he left office was the renaming of New River Gorge National River in West Virginia to New River Gorge National Park and Preserve, as well as the expansion of Saguaro National Park in Arizona by about 1,200 acres. Both those changes were called for in the Consolidated Appropriations Act for Fiscal 2021 that Congress passed in late December and which was signed into law by Trump shortly thereafter. Were those changes significant? We're exploring that question in today's podcast with Joy Oaks, the Senior Director of the Mid-Atlantic Region for the National Parks Conservation Association, and Kevin Dahl, the Arizona Program Manager for the National Parks Conservation Association. We'll be back in a minute with those conversations. Western National Parks Association is a nonprofit education partner of the National Park Service. WNPA supports parks across the West developing products, services, and programs that enhance the visitor experience, understanding, and appreciation of national parks. Learn more at WNPA.org. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to deepen the public's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It is also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference at friendsofacadia.org. Many years ago, during the last century, when I was a much younger adventurer, I actually was able to enjoy the new river before it was added to the national park system as a national river. During my college days at West Virginia University, I spent several years as a whitewater guide for a company that ran both the Cheat River in northern West Virginia, as well as the new river in the center of the state. In fact, my uh, first whitewater trip was actually on the Gauley River, which now is a national recreation area, but that's another story. Guiding on the New River was an incredible experience if you love the outdoors and paddling. To float through that landscape before it was part of the park system and a more visible magnet for travelers was an experience that I've never forgotten. Come forward to the 21st century, and the New River has a new name. It's now a national park and preserve. To discuss that name change and the implications it carries, we're joined today by Joy Oaks, Senior Director of the Mid-Atlantic Region for the National Parks Conservation Association. Welcome to The Traveler, Joy. Thanks so much for having me, Kurt. So, Joy, you're very lucky in that you're in the Mid-Atlantic Region, so close to the New River while I'm out in the Rockies, you know, a couple of days' drive away. I mean, the New River really does embrace a, a beautiful, wonderful landscape, doesn't it? It's an incredible place, and you understand why people wanted it to be a national park and why that effort was successful. It's at the heart of a globally significant forest. 
It has some of the highest diversity of plants and animals in the park system, second only to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, which is much larger. And of course, the recreational opportunities, not only white water, uh, there's wonderful flat water, uh, stand up paddle boarding is uh, making a big presence there on New River, as well as hiking and biking and rock climbing. It's renowned for outstanding opportunities to, to climb. So it's really a treasure. And that's, you know, that's not even getting into some of the cultural resources that are there at New River Gorge. It showcases America's railroading history, coal mining history, which of course gets into our immigration and, and racial history. And it's just a rich, rich, rich place in terms of history and culture and ecological values. It really is. And, and of course, you know, you can't overlook the geology of it. I mean, they, they call it the new river, and yet it might just be the oldest river on the continent, no? And it flows south to north instead of north to south. It flows south to north, and it's North America's oldest river. I believe that is correct. And, you know, New River Gorge itself is, you know, pretty deep. It's I think the highest elevation is 3,300 feet or so. You get down to the river and that's at around 800 feet elevation. So you've got quite a bit of uh, diversity of habitat, which of course supports the biodiversity. Yeah, yeah. And of course, the, the rafting experience. I mean, I, I have to keep coming back to that when people mention the new river. I remember one weekend, um, we had more guides than, than customers. And so um, four of us guides took a, a small, what we called a suicide boat. Um, it supposedly was a, a six-person raft, but it was really pretty small, and it comfortably fit the four of us. And the beauty of it is we could run a rapid, go to shore, pick up the raft, run back up river, and then run the rapid again. And just just a wonderful time. You know, the as you mentioned, boat. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I was much younger. <laughs> yes, yes. My, um, my first rafting experience on the new, the guide in the boat in front of us fell out in the first rapid. And I thought, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I did that a couple of times, some, sometimes on purpose. Yeah, but, um, that's what they always say. Absolutely. And those activities aren't going away. I mean, incredible rafting, climbing, bird watching, mountain biking, hiking. So I have to wonder, why the name change? Well, it's a good question. And you mentioned earlier the New River brand or, or the National Park brand. And there are 30 odd different designations. Uh, There's a bunch. Park units in the national park system. And that leads to some confusion and unawareness, a lack of awareness that a place is managed by the National Park Service. I mean, if you buttonhole people on the National Mall in Washington, a lot of them would have no idea that it's managed by the national park system as part of the national park system. So I think there are five national rivers in the system. And that doesn't immediately say to many people, National Park Service, this is really cool. Mm -hmm. um, of course, once you get there, you see how cool it is. Is that a good thing, though? I mean, like you said, there are only so many, quote unquote, national parks. And there's a, a wide audience out there across America and even overseas who want to go to a national park quote unquote. And so that's got to generate some problems for, for some units that um, maybe can't handle the hordes of crowds that are heading there. I don't know. Right. Well, I think look at what New River Gorge has to offer. There's no question that the ecological resources and the cultural resources rise to the level of national park standards. It's an incredible place. It's uh, globally significant. 
uh, it goes beyond nationally significant. And we haven't even talked about yet its value for habitat in the face of climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, because of the differential in elevation, because you've got um, uh, northeast facing slopes and southwest facing slopes, you've got plateaus, you've got the river, there's this incredible diversity of, of habitat. And you also have a lot of local connectivity with other forests. And so it's, in, uh, according to the Nature Conservancy's analysis, it's just an incredible resource for plants and animals as the climate continues to change. And actually when New River Gorge was first added to the national park system, that was part of the debate was it was, there were proposals then to create it as a national park. So it's, it's not, a, not a new idea. Uh, the resource is, is there. It's, it's interesting because um, some communities want a national park in their backyard and some don't. I know um, Dinosaur National Monument, there's been an effort for decades to, to have it redesignated as a national park. And there's been local opposition to that. And so I don't know if we'll ever see it, but certainly uh, dinosaur is worthy of national park status. The size of New River Gorge didn't immediately change under this uh, name change, did it? It's still roughly 72,000 acres? That's right. The legislation that Congress passed and the president signed at the end of the last Congress empowers the Park Service to add, I think it's up to 100 acres to provide more parking, which may not seem all that significant, but I happen to be at the parking for the endless wall, climbing wall last, well, two Novembers ago now. And um, they need more parking for some of the more popular areas and that will enable them to address that. It also allows them to acquire, it's between three and 4,000 acres of land not um, included in the boundary today right. um, that would be added to the preserve. So one of the, I want to go back to a point you raised a few minutes ago, Kurt, about the ability of the Park Service to manage visitation that might increase because of the new designation. And, you know, the reality is um, a lot of parks are struggling to meet visitation um, We've seen a lot of parks have seen significant increases in visitation because of the pandemic. Both they have uh, people have more time, particularly if they're not at, at their jobs or for whatever reasons, or just want to get outside and um, be in nature. And the park system overall is struggling with um, not enough annual funding. Now, part of the good news is that the last Congress and the, pres the former president um, signed into law the Great American Outdoors Act, which provides, will provide a significant amount of, of money, six and a half billion dollars over five years to address the maintenance, uh, the repair backlog in not just national parks, but also other federal public lands. And that's sorely needed. I think New River Gorge, their repair backlog was more than $20 million. Wow. And yes, and there's a belief that that was um, underestimated, not uh, just because greater analysis showed greater need but at least $20 million in repair needs. And that's everything from buildings to trails to you name it, bathrooms. And so the Great American Outdoors Act will help significantly in parks, New River Gorge and parks around the country. The other piece of that, and you mentioned 72,000 acres inside the boundary there at New River Gorge, the Park Service only has 53,000 acres and change of those 72. 
some of that differential, 19, um, 18,000 acre differential is state parks. They're gonna continue being state parks, but some of it is private lands. And the other piece of the Great American Outdoor Act, uh, Outdoors Act is permanent funding for the Land and Water Conservation Fund to the tune of 900 million annually, which is twice what has been appropriated many years, and of course, some years far less. And so the uh, Park Service, hopefully at, at New River Gorge, will be able to tap into those funds. Because that's the other part of expectations, um, not just for the uh, capital N, capital P national parks, but national historical parks, battlefields, et cetera, uh, when I first came to National Parks Conservation Association 20 years ago, one of the first campaigns I got involved in was contesting a luxury housing development on private land inside of Valley Forge National Historical Park. How could this be? And they were one action away. The developer was, was suing the local township to get their permit. And it was the last meeting the county, the uh, township had to vote on uh, approving the permit. And another friend of mine and I just couldn't stand it. And we organized a candlelight vigil outside of that <laughs> meeting. And we didn't have that many people, but when you read the story in the Philadelphia Inquirer, you had no idea if it was six people or 6,000 standing outside that meeting. And uh, ultimately, the uh, Democratic congressman and the Republican administration at the time worked together to get land and water conservation funds to preserve that. And you don't want to get to that point. You want to be able to preserve that land, buy it from willing sellers far in advance of things coming down to the last vote. So hopefully New River can tap into some of those funds and really preserve the integrity uh, of the land inside of uh, its boundary. Yeah. Um, speaking of the land inside its boundaries, um, under the, the, the redesignation, I think roughly 65,000 of those 72,000 acres that we're talking about in general, roughly 65,000 of those acres our national preserve, and only about 7,600 acres, I believe, are national park. And those are in four separate parcels. And, and somebody told me that, you know, a couple of those parcels are postage stamp size. But you know, why not just name it New River Gorge National Preserve? I mean, hunting and fishing pretty much go hand in hand with living in West Virginia. I mean, I knew that. I spent nine years there. And um, if you're going to live there, you want to you want to take advantage of the outdoors, whether you're rafting or whether you're fishing or hunting. Is this just um, an economic move to appinge the uh, the national park designation to it to, to try and uh, gin up some more money for the, the state and the gateway communities? Well, you make a good point about hunting and fishing being part of the, the local culture the Nash, as a national river, hunting was allowed pretty much all the places it'll be allowed uh, in the preserve. There was one shift in, I think at least one shift, maybe two. Ultimately, there was a lot of back and forth on um, what part of the uh, former national river would continue to allow, allow hunting. In a, a funny kind of way, we talked earlier about the biological integrity of New River Gorge. Hunting helps with that. You know, I look out my window here in um, suburban DC and I see six or seven deer just without even trying hoovering up the landscape. You need more wolves. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wouldn't argue with that. And the ability to hunt actually uh, helps keep the forest healthy. You know, I think it's back to the National Park brand. You know, the original bill that was introduced would have designated the whole thing a national park huh. and hmm. still allow hunting, not change oh. anything. And Was that by Senator uh, Capito? Uh, right, Senator Capito introduced Capito. the bill. And 
we were very pleased when the bill was reintroduced in the last Congress as a park and preserve. You know, I like I said, I spent a number of years in, in West Virginia, and I just fell in love with the state. And, and I would joke to some of my friends back in New Jersey that, geez, you know, you could just put a fence around the whole state and make it a national park. It's so beautiful. And, and there are talks about possibly creating other national parks in West Virginia, um, a little bit north of New River Gorge is uh, the Potomac Highlands area, the Dolly Sods area, Black uh, Blackwater Falls State Park. I know there's been a a movement to try and gain a, a national park up there. Any thoughts on that? I mean, talking about uh, improving corridors for ecological benefits, um, that has to be uh, a help if that were done. Right. I think there are a lot of ways to preserve um, the values of of a landscape. And you mentioned dinosaur earlier and the diversity of opinion about whether it should be a national park. That's critical that creation of whatever protected status have local support Mm -hmm. because ultimately the local communities are stewards in in many ways of preserved areas. And like my story about Valley Forge, the members of the township board had incredible power over the integrity of Valley Forge National Historical Park because they could have permitted that development inside the boundary on land that General Washington and the Continental Army used um, during the encampment during the American Revolution. So to an enormous extent, the integrity of protected areas, whatever their designation, is in the hands of local people and local decision makers. And you wanna have local support for whatever preservation is is advanced. And um, I'm not up to date on that particular proposal Um, And um, I think that it's important to build as much support as as possible before moving forward. So until we we start hearing uh, uh, greater calls for it from within West Virginia, nobody should be holding their breath yet for another addition to the park system in West Virginia. Local leadership is key. It's absolutely key. But nonetheless, you don't need a national park designation to go enjoy West Virginia because it really is a gorgeous state in many areas. Yes, and there are other, I think um, West Virginia has six units of the national park system, including Harper's Ferry National Historical Park in the Eastern Panhandle. And that has such wonderful civil war and then civil rights history. Mm -hmm. Um, The first gathering of, of, civil rights leaders, large gathering in the United States in 1906 at Stora College. And as well as a land of such incredible beauty, Thomas Jefferson said it was worth a a voyage across the Atlantic to enjoy. And and that was at a time when, you know, a voyage across the Atlantic took some time. Yeah. And um, it's, They both, both Harper's Ferry and and New River and the national parks of Southern West Virginia are among my favorite places to to visit. Yeah, it's been a long time since I've been back and I'm hoping to get there one of these days. West Virginia misses you, Kurt. Come back. (laughs) We've been talking today with Joy Oaks, the Mid-Atlantic Regional Director for the National Parks Conservation Association about that new national park in West Virginia, New River Gorge National Park and Preserve. Joy, thanks so much for joining us and filling in some of the questions I had about that new designation. You're welcome. Listener and reader support make National Parks Traveler possible every day of the year. If you enjoy the Traveler's content, please consider a donation via nationalparkstraveler.org. We all aspire to leave a legacy of good, right? One way or the other, our parks and public lands are all of our legacies. Join Wild Tributes for the Parks community with apparel that pays tribute to where legacy roams. Together, we can, and will, make a difference for the parks. 
Join us at wildtribute.com. The Grand Teton National Park Foundation is a private, nonprofit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grand Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the National Park System for decades to come. See their successes at gtnpf.org. The North Cascades Institute has a large portfolio. It is an environmental learning center, training center, conference center, and leadership center, all set in the splendor of the North Cascades National Park Complex. Learn more at ncascades.org. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. Show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. Saguaro National Park in southern Arizona is an icon of the Sonoran Desert. It covers a bit more than 91,000 acres and is split into two districts with Tucson in the middle. You can head into the backcountry from the desert floor to the park's roof atop the Rincon Mountains in the Rincon Mountain District of the park, or you can explore the Sonoran Desert Wilderness in the Tucson Mountain District. Thanks to legislation passed by the last Congress, the park is growing by a bit more than 1,200 acres. The legislation was championed by U.S. Representative Raul Grijalva, a Democrat from Arizona who chairs the House Natural Resources Committee. Uh, the legislation authorized the Interior Department to acquire approximately 1,232 acres of land to include in the park. The bill also directs the National Park Service to study future opportunities for expansion with a focus on land with high natural, cultural, recreational, and scenic values. Kevin Dahl, the Arizona Program Manager for the National Parks Conservation Association, spoke in favor of the expansion back in July during an appearance before the House Subcommittee on National Parks, National Forests, and Public Lands. He joins us today to get into the intricacies of the expansion. Welcome to The Traveler, Kevin. Thanks, Kurt. Thanks for having me. So, 1,200 acres. I mean, that doesn't really sound like a lot um, to some people. What, what does it include, and why was it... Um, aimed at this 1,200 acres in particular? In the larger scheme of things, it isn't a very big number. It's 36 little separate parcels, each of which has some park value or some reason for being included in the park. And they vary. Some of it's great riparian habitat. Some of it's pr to protect trail access or a view shed from a trail. One is to, to, to eventually close out an easement across a park where a, private landowner has the right someday, should they care to, to build a road right across Sorrow National Park. When we started out this process, we had a lot more acres, um, but in the intervening years, and this has been 12 years in the making, uh, one big parcel, uh, 273 acres was donated to the park and added to the park without any legislation. One developer dropped out uh, a very significant chunk, and we hope that someday they'll come back. And we even lost a few acres at the very beginning. You called it uh, the original bill that was passed the house had a little more than 1,200 acres. The final bill had 1,152 acres. We had to do some compromising at the end to get it part of the uh, package that passed Congress that was part of the COVID-19 relief bill and the government funding bill, um, but gladly willing to do that to see this thing pass. You know, Saguaro is an interesting park because it is split into two districts, and, and it's got this metropolitan area right smack in the middle of them. Um, the last time I was down there in the park, you know, I was out in the Cactus Forest, and you can look beyond the Cactus Forest into downtown Tucson practically. Do these additions, um, I imagine, help uh, provide an additional buffer for, between the park and the city? Yes, some of them do. Um it is it is an unusual park. When it was established, it, those both units were outside of the city, and you'd be traveling down ro dirt roads to get to them. Um, but the city has grown up just to the edges, and the park does have the challenges of, of being an urban park when originally it was much more um, a wild park. There's several parcels that are included that that do this very important thing. The the county has 
a hiking preserve, the Sweetwater Preserve, great hiking, great mountain biking near the park. And the inclusion of these parcels means that we can connect that protected area to the park specifically for wildlife. Um, it's not clear that we will anytime soon have those hikers come into the park that way because it's just not convenient. But wildlife uh, uh, connections between the park, the Sweetwater Preserve, and then further down into the habitat of the Santa Cruz River will be protected. Now, you mentioned riparian areas, and, and for folks who have been to Saguaro, you know, they might have driven through the, the Cactus Forest or, or over to the Tucson District, and, and you don't really see much riparian area, or at least I didn't during my visit. No, you, you kind of have to know where it is. You know, there are a few ponds and some of these are ephemeral, there's springs, but the riparian area I'm talking about is along Rincon Creek, which is on the southern border of uh, the east unit, the Rincon Mountain unit. And protecting that riparian area, I think is the highest order of importance in the desert environment. That's the most threatened sort of habitat. And so it's great that some parcels that are that are on that, an almost permanent stream at that point will be included in the park. What, what was the threat um, to that land? Well, someone could build a house right on it um, and drop a well and the riparian goes away. So uh, uh, keeping the, the riparian corridors undeveloped and ideally in public hands, it ensures that they will continue to function and to provide habitat for the, the many animals, not just riparian species, but the far ranging predators, they come down for water. They provide corridors for a migration. Uh, it's real key to have these streams in the desert. Yeah, I'm sure. Now, as um, the legislation, I believe, uh, it also directs the Park Service to, to look at future opportunities for land acquisitions? Sadly, no. That was another thing we had to bargain away. I don't know what the big threat of doing a study uh, is particularly, but the Republicans didn't want to have the Park Service look at potential additional additions. I didn't care so much because this bill, in fact, was not the result of a park study. Sometimes Congress directs specific parks to study their boundaries, to report back, and then they can act. In this case, this was a citizen's proposal. It was started actually before I started my job 12 years ago by people who were interested in the park and seeing particular the riparian areas protected. And, and they looked around to see what other private lands, you know, these are all willing sellers, at least they were when we, we contacted them, uh, would be appropriate to add to the park. And, you know, after a little rest, we'll do that again. Yeah, I was going to say with the uh, Land and Water Conservation um, Fund finally fully funded, um, there, there's some money out there where I would think if you do have the willing sellers. Yes, yeah. And um, Saguaro has had some high priority purchases. They have other inholdings uh, of private land that they, they, they are eager to eventually get. In, in addition, there's a long term problem uh, in that there's state trust lands in holdings in the park. There's little parcels of state trust lands, which is not very helpful for the state land department because they want to earn money on their, their land and they really can't. So someday we hope to, to see that traded. Do you have a strategic plan um, looking down the road? How many um, potential acres there, there might be available to acquire? Oh yeah, there's at least a couple thousand more. Um, there's some larger tracks. You know, quantity and quality are different factors though sure. and sometimes it's the it's the 10 acre parcel um that's key key to obtain so so where do you go to now do you immediately rush back to congress um, since the democrats have a slight edge and and try and uh, get the ball rolling again or do you uh i'm uh, working on some other park uh, boundary <laughs> expansions too there, there's some very modest at Fort Bowie. There's some uh, important military history sites that weren't included in Fort Bowie. We'll, that, we'll, we'll, we'll get to those, Kevin. I just want to know, um, you know are you getting Saguaro. No, I think the first thing is, you know, to work with the park. The park's going to do some internal prioritizing and figure out which landowners they can work with. You know, nothing happens fast. No, no, uh, no. Landowners have the possibility of donating. Uh, and for some, that works out real well, uh, f uh, given their financial and tax situation. Um, in the past, uh, larger landowners have traded for government disposal lands, and that's been beneficial for them. Um, and like you say, the Land and Water Conservation Fund monies are available. Um, as you know, it's a competitive process, both within the Park Service and then between all the agencies that are uh, eligible for those funds. Right. 
okay, now now we can move on to some of those other projects. I mean, there, there there's uh, an essay essay I've been driving on the Traveler from time to time looks at whether parks can serve as an impediment to the sixth mass extinction. And, and obviously they can if if they're allowed to. And by that, I mean, we have to look at uh, corridors between parks or expanding parks and whatnot. And, and certainly that's one aspect of expanding the national park system. And the other aspect, of course, is is looking at the cultural and the historical aspects that should be preserved in the parks. And so in that regard, you know, are those two areas, um, you mentioned Fort Bowie, obviously that's more of a, a cultural historical thing, I would think, than uh, um, slowing the sixth mass extinction, but it's important just the same. It is important. Uh, interesting cultural sites at, at Fort Bowie, which would be better managed and interpreted by the Park Service. But you, you may remember Fort Bowie is located at a pass between two mountain ranges. And in and of itself, it's an important wildlife corridor. So um, there was a threat of um, a developer, a, a bank had bought a, bun- a ranch there and was going to turn it into ranchettes, which is not good for wildlife passage. That threat's passed, but it still would be nice to, to make sure that pass remains a pass. Um, you know, to protect wildlife corridors, oftentimes the actions outside of the park and coming back to Saguaro, for instance, there's a proposal to build a freeway within a mile of the west side of the west unit in a sparsely developed valley, Avra Valley, for almost no purpose other than to build a freeway. Mm -hmm. And people, all the wildlife agencies are very concerned that that would cut off access for like desert bighorn sheep and deer, other migrating wildlife that come in from the wildlands to the west. Um, So those are issues that I work on. But you're right, the, the, the cultural and historical sites that the park so well protect and interpret are important too. Another bill I worked on that didn't pass this last Congress, but will be introduced shortly is Casa Grande Ruins National Monument. There's some incredible ruins um, around the Great House that if they were managed and protected by the Park Service, visitors could get a better understanding of the lifeways of the people who use the Great House. And those resources would be better protected. The The local community loves it because it becomes a cultural tourism bonus. You're not just going to go see the Great House, but then you might stay for the afternoon tour of that Hohokam ball court down the road. And then you might stay in a local motel or have stay for dinner. So it's got strong bipartisan support, but uh, just didn't make it over the finish line this, this last year. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's job security for you, something else to to work on. You and I have plenty of job security. (laughs) Plenty of things to talk about the parks and to protect the parks to last more than our lifetimes. Boy, isn't that the truth. I remember once my my son was asking me, well, Dad, how long can you run the Traveler? How many park issues are there? (laughs) (laughs) They never end. I mean, biology, botany, paleontology, zoology. Anyway migratory corridors you mentioned um organ pipe cactus yeah it's a big big expanse and yet um we've got this border wall we got to get rid of that wall um or or open up portions of it if if nothing else the the wall was not asked for by people who are actually managing the border people on the ground in the border patrol um and it won't be that expensive to cut through some portions of it, especially where wildlife clearly go, like near Quito Bikito Springs. Mm-hmm. And also where uh, the Tona Autumn uh, travel across as well for religious ceremonies and were outraged by the wall. So that the Biden administration needs to deal with that pretty quickly. People are also talking about, well, let's make Oregon Pipe a national park. I mean, there was a proposal in the last Congress to do that for Chiricahua National Monument. Mm-hmm. In my mind, Oregon Pipe is national park quality, too. You know, it, it's funny you mention that because just the other day, one of our readers was was reaching out to me about, you know, park designations and was curious about the New River Gorge National Park and Preserve that was just created along with the Saguaro expansion. And I mentioned, you know, two two places that should be national parks but aren't or Oregon Pipe and Dinosaur National Monument. Although, although you have to <coughs> worry that that park designation would would generate more crowds to those places, which could be detrimental. It it could be. Um, Oregon Pipe needs more visitation. Um, It's undervisited, in my opinion. The same is kind of true with Chiricahua. I think it has the capacity for more visitors. It's not a crowded place like 
arches or the south rim of the Grand Canyon. Yeah, yeah. Now, you mentioned cutting holes in the fence to allow wildlife to get through. Wouldn't that defeat the purpose of the fence, the perceived purpose? Yes. The border was as managed as well as it can with the existing fence structure. There, there was vehicle barriers that allowed wildlife to go through. Near, near the crossing at Lukeville, there was pedestrian fences that prevented pedestrians from coming through. And that's, that worked fine. That's what we should go back to. They're also currently lighting it up all night, which is devastating to bat migration and who knows what. Um, it's become a killing field for migratory songbirds because the predators just love that open space and uh, they will be taken down pretty rapidly. And the space between the bars aren't big enough for much of anything except a lizard or something or a small rodent. And then they have 60 feet of scraped desert to go across before they can find safe habitat. So um, the purposes of delineating that border was fine before this monstrosity was built. And now we have to deal with the impacts of this monstrosity and mitigate that. Do you sense there's any inclination um, on the incoming Biden administration to to do that now? Or, or is that um, something that he just doesn't want to deal with, with with so many other important issues to tackle? We'll find out soon. You know, there, there are a coalition of border groups that, you know, we belong to that are um, – strategizing and presented information to the to the Biden incoming team, the transition team. And uh, he's on record, you know, day one, no more construction. And we hope that that actually happens. The government contracts can be stopped at any point for any reason. So that should be no problem. Yeah. All right, Kevin. Well, I appreciate uh, the time today talking about Saguaro and, and some of the work you're doing down there in Arizona. And uh, look forward to it uh, uh, growing um, more, more park space in the years to come. Thanks. Great talking to you, Kurt. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. You can stay abreast of news and features involving national parks and protected areas by visiting nationalparkstraveler.org throughout the week and by signing up for our weekly newsletter, which recaps the past week's news. You can find a sign-up button on the Traveler website. For The Traveler, this is Kurt Repencheck. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, These musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Park's Travelers podcasts. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. Editing and production work for the National Park's Traveler podcast series is done by Splitbeard Productions. You can learn more about us at splitbeardproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.